Good morning and welcome to Passion Church Online. My name is Devin and I'm here to bring you this week's announcements. We have our Freedom Festival happening on July 4th. It'll take place right across the street at Oberholster Elementary at 10 a.m. It'll be a great time full of food, games, and fun. You might get a little wet, so make sure if you do plan on coming to bring an extra change of clothes if you're looking to get wet. And just come have a great time with all of your friends on July 4th. Thank you again so much for joining us here today online from wherever you're watching at. Let's go ahead and hop right into service.
we thank you that you never leave us or forsake us.
don't get tired of singing his praises. Come on, I just encourage you right now, just sing it louder, whatever it is, sing it over your circumstance. This allows us to look up. Because we may have had a tough week, we may have had a tough year, we may have had a tough month, we may have had a tough morning, but just worship God and focus on him. Because he's already gone before you. He's working behind the scenes. Come on, our circumstance doesn't change our love for him. Sing holy are you God. right where you are just where we are just lift your hands 
us lifting our hands is just a sign of God, I'm giving you everything. God, I pour out my life. God, I pour out even all of my mistakes, God. I give it all to you. And so I worship you with everything that I have. My life is yours. It makes me think of the room right before Jesus. Right before Jesus is about to be crucified, about to be arrested. This woman pours out oil, pours out perfume. just as an act of worship. And Father, I just pray that today that this is be who we are, this be our cry, that we give you everything. With everything I've got. Come on, sing that. My heart will sing. Come on, can we just tag that part? with everything. With everything. Come on, God may be asking some of you to get down on your knees. If you're still thinking about everything that's gone wrong, maybe God is calling you to get down on your knees. Maybe God's calling you to sing a little bit louder. Come on, if you're watching online, maybe God is just telling you right now just to turn the TV up, turn up the computer. Maybe stand up from where you are, just throw your hands in the air. Until you say, with everything, and you can confidently say, God, I am pouring out my life. walked in this morning and you haven't given your life to Christ you haven't given him everything just right now he wants it all he wants it all so you know I have too much mess I have too much sin I have too many things that I've done wrong look he wants it all because he loves us he died for us so, Father, God, I just pray that your Holy Spirit is right now, you're moving in this place. And yet that you are drawing us, that you are, you are pulling us to a place where we can say, yes, God, we want to give you everything. God, we lift up our movers. These are 10 people that we've been praying for on a regular basis that we know need to surrender it all. They need to give you everything. God, we thank you and we praise you in advance for the lost sheep that will come home. Father, we thank you. Father, have your way this morning. Open up our ears, open up our hearts to receive every word that is coming from your throne. Every word that's coming into, into, our, into our lives, may it, be, may it fall on good soil. May it be planted, may it take root. May it change us. May it grow us to be closer to you, God. In Jesus' name, if you believe that, say amen. Amen, amen. We are so glad to have you here with us this morning at Passion. If you would take some time, give a high five, give a fist bump with those that are around you. Welcome each other. And you guys can have a seat.
This video is going to play from Pastor Steve, if you guys watch this. Julie and I are not there this morning. There's a reason, and that is this weekend is our 30-year anniversary. So we probably got married when we were six. But 30 years, it's hard to believe it's been that long. So anyway, I wanted to uh, take the weekend and spend a special trip, a little time with her. Uh, so I started thinking, who could I invite to come and take my pulpit and do almost a good, as good a job as I can? Well, actually, probably better. Somebody that I trust and somebody that's been such a great friend uh, to myself and John and his wife Lori are very special people and we have a long history together and I trust them and I know that they're going to be a great blessing to you. And so what I would like for you to do, Passion Church, is I'd like for you to really lean in today as Pastor John Leggett um, comes and brings the word. We're so honored to have him and his wife Lori with us today. And of course, you know his son, Austin, and daughter-in-law, Natalie. They're just family, and we want you to receive them like that. And just lean in and really get everything you can get from the word that he brings today. So please give a big round of applause to Pastor John Leggett as he brings it. There we go. Andrew's already starting out trying to silence me. I will say that that is the best time I've ever heard your pastor speak when he first came on the screen. Well, good morning, Passion. My name is Pastor John Leggett. I'm so honored to be here today. I am good friends with your pastor, him and his wife, Julie. I count them as close friends. And I uh, I don't know if you know just how blessed you are. Do you know that today? You are blessed to have an amazing pastor who loves the Lord. And I'll tell you this today, he loves you. And he is blessed by you. And uh, I hope you're in prayer for them. Pray that they have a wonderful time while they're on their, what, 30th, 30th anniversary? I knew he was a lot older than me. I knew he looked a lot older than me. But I wasn't sure he was that much older than me. But it is a joy and an honor to be here today and to be in the house of the Lord. And I believe that God has given me a word for you today. I don't say that much. And uh, many times I'm very careful when I throw out God has given me a word. Uh, let me share with you. Uh, we're doing a sermon series at our church called Off Topic. And we've been allowing the church to actually create the sermons by asking us questions. And guys, that can be a little bit dangerous. If you can only imagine, some we throw away, some we act like we never found. But we had one the other day that I felt like I needed to answer. I can't say that it was so much the Lord, but I just felt I needed to answer the question. And uh, so I began to build a sermon around it. And uh, the question was actually, kind of a very sensitive topic, not only in America today, but actually especially within the church. And the question was about, can those who are homosexual serve in your church? And I began to build a whole sermon around that. And then I took my staff, every year we go on vacation, I take them to a church somewhere, we do training, have a good time. Even while I was on vacation, I shared with my staff the sermon that God had given me, or the sermon that I had gotten. Well, that Friday and that Saturday before the Sunday morning service, God began to change my sermon. In fact, I woke up early Sunday morning and even did some more work on it. And today, I want to share with you what I feel maybe God has laid upon my heart. For us as the body of Christ, when we're dealing with sin, the sin of those around us, how we as men and women of God deal with that. God had led me, and I want you to turn with me today to John chapter 8, beginning with verse 3. 
John chapter 8, beginning verse 3. It is a joy to be with my son and my daughter-in-law today. Uh, woo! Yeah, you can do that. Woo! There's no greater joy for a dad uh, to have his son and his daughter-in-law working in the kingdom of God and working in church. I am so proud of my son, Austin. I'm so proud of Natalie and love them so much. It's a joy. It's also good to have my wife here today. Laura, raise your hand. She's my better half. She makes me who I am today. In fact, she actually prepared this sermon. I just look better presenting it to you guys. It is that a teacher of the law and the Pharisees brought a woman called in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was called in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. I want you to remember that part right there. Such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to ride on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The oldest ones first, until only Jesus was left. With the woman still standing there, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. And I want you to listen to this last passage right here. Go now. And leave your life of sin. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this word that we're about to receive today. I pray this morning that every heart and every mind to be open, God, to receive, Lord, what you've got in store. And not one, not one would leave this house the same way that they came. But will be blessed and changed by your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. So let me begin to set the, the scene for you. Jesus just come back from the Mount of Olives. He comes to the temple and he begins to teach. As Jesus is teaching all of those who have flocked to come to hear what he has to say, all of a sudden it tells us that the scribes and the Pharisees bring a woman and throw her at the feet of Jesus. As they throw her at the feet of Jesus, they begin to say to Jesus, we have caught this woman in the act of adultery. Not that we've heard, not that someone told but we actually called her in the act of adultery. At that moment, Jesus doesn't react. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't even make a comment. The Bible at that moment tells us that Jesus bends down and begins to write on the ground. They keep bombarding him with questions. What do you say? What are we to do? At that moment, Jesus says, you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And then Jesus bends back down and begins to write on the ground again. At that moment, the Bible says, slowly, starting from the oldest, and we'll explain that in a few moments, but starting with the oldest, they begin to leave. Now, not just the ones who had accused, because if you read in the passage, it says that only Jesus and the woman was left. So not only are the accusers leaving, but those that were attending begin to leave. What a powerful word we hear next. Jesus then 
says to the woman, woman, where are your accusers? I don't know if I'm biblically correct, but I wonder if Jesus, when he said that, looks around. I don't see anybody. You, you see anybody? And probably with all the stones laying on the ground as, as they begin to drop their stones. In fact, you, you've heard of this saying, drop the mic or drop mic. I wonder if that moment when Jesus said, you who are without sin, cast the first stone, you begin to hear all the stones drop. And he says to the woman, woman, they don't accuse you. I don't accuse you. Leave and go and sin no more. What a powerful, powerful story of redemption, of God's grace, of God's love. That for you who may be here today, and I hope none are here today, but maybe you who are very religious, it becomes a moment that we realize and understand that we serve a God who is not a condemning God. We serve a God who is not looking for us to make mistakes or have faults or failures so you get, boom, hey, you messed up. I heard this week that they were having the Tour de France. And the Tour de France, there was a bike rider by the name of Tony Martin. And Tony Martin would crash and start a pile up like they've never had before. He would crash, and then all the, the cyclists behind him would crash also. Now, it really wasn't Tony Martin's fault. What happened was, is there was one of the fans that were on the side, as the cyclists were coming by, has a sign that stuck the sign out too far, and Tony Martin hit the sign, and it tripped him and made him fall, and then all those behind him piled up. Now, you're probably thinking what I would think is that most likely she's holding a sign saying, come on, bikers, or maybe a sign with her, her favorite cyclist written on there, go, 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 John Leggett, how great you are. But I read in the article, in fact, I saw the video. And in the video, there's this, this girl and she's hanging over the road with a sign that's about this long. And she's hanging over the road and she's not even looking at the cyclist. She's actually looking at the camera with German written on the sign. I, you know, my German's not that great. I actually did spend about three months in Germany, and so I can count ein Swein Thrive feel fool. But that's as good as I can do in German. So I had to look up to see what her sign actually said. It actually said, I think, Omar or Opa, something like that. And you know what it actually meant? Hey, Grandma. Hey, Granny. So in other words, the woman didn't even care about the cyclist. What she was doing was trying to get on camera saying, Hey, Grandma. And she tripped up all the cyclists. See, it's kind of a similar situation here. Pharisees, the scribes, really don't even care that they caught the woman in adultery. They really don't even care what she's done. They bring this woman. Can you imagine the humiliation? All these people are standing around, and they bring this woman to Jesus, and they throw her at Jesus' feet and said, we called her in adultery, which is laughable. Because they said, the Bible says we are to stone her. Well, where's the man? Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it takes two to tango, amen? Or don't say amen. That's more of an old me moment. But at that moment, where's the man? In fact, in Leviticus chapter 20, it says that both the man and the woman are to be stoned. But see, they didn't come actually because they cared about her, her, her sin or her mistake or her adultery. They came to accuse so that then they could, could accuse Jesus. Today I want to share with you how we as individuals handle sin. How we as individuals, as Christians, handle when those around us have failed, made mistakes, have got sin in their life. Number one, I want you to write this down. 
affirmation or alienation are not the only answers to an accusation. Affirmation or alienation are not the only answers to an accusation. See, we have one of two ways as Christians that we usually handle sin. Either one is as we affirm it. We keep quiet. Uh, we don't want to cause problems. We don't want to say anything. And because of that, many times what we do in our lives is we just don't address the problem. Or we go the other way. And that is as believers, we become self-righteous as we get further away from our salvation. I've arrived. I don't make mistakes anymore. I'm like Andrew Ham, who is perfect, who has no faults in his life, who his wife says he's the greatest thing in the world. And what happens is we, we alienate those who we find out have sin in their life. But the thing is, we don't do it for the the reason that we think we do. We do it because many times if I can point at your sin, you're not looking at my sin. If I can tell you how bad you are, it doesn't make me feel so bad about who I am. That if I can begin to show you the faults and the failures in your life. See, the problem is we can't, also affirm the sin. We can love people, but still tell them things that need to go from their lives. It says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That if I love you, I love you enough to not let you go down the road you're going down, because I know that it leads to death and destruction. But in the same token, I love you enough that I don't begin to beat you down, hurt you, try to condemn you because of the sins in your life. Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says this, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. How many of you that God sent his son Jesus Christ to die upon a cross for you that at that moment that he died, he not only died for your sins past, but present and you're ready and future. Because some of y'all going to mess up. Andrew, you're going to mess up. I know you think he's perfect, guys, don't you? But he's going to mess up. He's going to make a mistake. And with his mistake should not come your condemnation. Because all you do is alienate him. Can you imagine the woman? In fact, we know in the story that we don't really know if the woman actually did it because for them to come without the man, either one, we know they were just jerks, or two is they may have just been lying. A false accusation to begin to get Jesus. We don't know because by law, they would have had to bring both the man and the woman, but they only brought the woman. You see, Christ came to this earth to die upon a cross for us. That we don't affirm someone's sin, but also we don't accuse them of their sin. I want you to write this down too, number two. The attitude of your accusation today will affirm the attitude of your accusers tomorrow. The attitude of your accusation today will affirm the attitude of your accusers tomorrow. As it go, you shall reap what you sow. We fail to remember that we've all sinned, and the Bible says, fallen short of the, the glory of God. And in this passage, what we, we come to realization is, is that all of us have failed, all of us have sinned, all of us have made mistakes, but the way that I treat others is the way I'll be treated in the future. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank, the two by four, the beam, the huge piece of metal sticking out of your own eye? 
Let me stop there for a second. This passage doesn't mean we can't judge. Christians misquote this all the time. I do have the right to judge, but it's how I judge that determines the impact I have on someone's sinful life. If I woke up and say to Lori, honey, this is in your life and you know you don't honor your husband enough. You need to honor your husband better, treat him better, love him better. You know, honey, you're, you're, you're wonderful, but God loves you and God's forgives you. Or I come up to my wife and I say, good gracious woman, can you act like you need to act and quit sinning and being disobedient and be submissive to your husband for once in your life? That second attitude would get me beat up. I know. I know the woman. I know what would happen. See, what we fail to realize, it's not that God's saying we can't judge. What God is saying is, it's how we judge and with the attitude that we judge. See, the attitude should be, I always want to restore you gently. I want to bring you back to a place of knowing Christ Jesus. I want to get that thing out of your life that is condemning you, hurting you, holding you back from being who God's called you to be. What I don't do is use that sin as a way to make myself feel better. I tell you what, I may be bad, but that Andrew Ham, my law, what he's done in his life makes me look like I'm a saint. Someone else's sin doesn't nullify my sin. And no matter how bad their sin may be, it doesn't mean my sin's any less. That we realize that how I treat others. In other words, if today I plant a seed of attitude of being judgmental, condemning, then the Bible says how I treat others today is how I'll be treated tomorrow when my sins come out, when my failures are made known, when others see my mistakes, then that's how I'll be treated. You see, as a believer that I learned that my responsibility is to try to bring them out of that place of condemnation. Number three, I want you to write this down. Compassion doesn't constitute compromise. Compassion doesn't constitute compromise. In John 8, 10, it says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, now I need to stop there because... When Jesus says woman, it sounds kind of rough, doesn't it? If you actually read there in, in the Greek, that word there, actually woman, is actually a sign of respect. It's a sign of respect. Not going woman. It's a sign of respect. Listen, I want you to hear that because even in the middle of her sin and her accusations, Jesus still loves her and respects her. In the middle of your failures and your mistakes, can I tell you that Jesus never stops loving you? He's still going to treat you with respect. He's still got a plan and purpose for your life. Your sin has not nullified your tomorrow. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. And neither do I condemn you. Now, Jesus could have stopped right there. See, what we don't realize is, is when Jesus is riding on the ground, remember? He begins to write. And they bombard Jesus. What do you say? And Jesus stands back up. You without sin cast the first stone. But I want to say something. I begin to look up that passage with the word right. And the word right there means to write, written. It also means this, to describe. I can't biblically back this up, but maybe I I think I I may be correct because I've never been wrong before. That when Jesus bends down the first time and begins to write, he, he writes down Austin. 
Natalie. Lori. Pastor Steve. And he stands back up and they're probably looking down. Why, why is he writing my name and how does he know my name? And he said, you without sin cast the first stone. And the Bible says that, that then Jesus bends back down and he begins to write again. Maybe this time where it says Austin, he puts a slash and he says, needs to be more obedient to his father. To Natalie, he says, needs to treat his fa- her father-in-law with more respect. Laurie needs to submit to her husband. Pastor Steve quit taking Pastor John's sermon as his own. And Jesus stands back up. You, who without sin cast the first stone. See, that moment, I believe that they saw their name written down in the dirt and they saw their sin beside it. And Jesus at that moment reminded them, listen, you've got sin, you've got failures, you've got mistakes. What I love is it said that the oldest left first. Why? They had more to lose. Or maybe, just maybe, because they were the oldest, Jesus wrote more mistakes that they had made because they had lived longer and had more sins in their life. But see, Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, go now and leave your life of sin. See, he doesn't condemn her. Jesus didn't come to condemn us, but to bring us to relationship to him. To bring us to the Father. But also with his grace, I want you to understand, does not come his compromise. That he understands where sin will take us. He understands what happens if we keep living in the lifestyle we've been living in. Many times we want the grace, but not the ground rules. We want God's compassion, but we don't want his commands. Many times we want his helping hand, but we don't want his honest voice. See, no matter what brought her here, yes, it was the Pharisees, it was the scribes, but ultimately what brought her here was her own sins. See, eventually your sins will take you somewhere that you don't want to go. It becomes a vehicle that drives you to a destination, and you won't like the destination when you get there. But can I tell you, all along the way, God won't condemn you. God won't hate you. In fact, God will love you. Can I tell you something today, I, something the Lord shared me years ago? There's nothing I can do that would disappoint God. There's nothing that I can do that would disappoint God. See, disappointment means that I missed an appointment. And God knew from the foundations of the world all the mistakes and all the failures that I would have. And he still called me to be a pastor. God knew from the foundations of the world everything you would ever do wrong. But he still loves you. And he still called you. And he still has a purpose and a plan for your life. The question is, who are you in the story? If you would have been there that day, if you could for a moment transform your mind to that, that story, all, all those sitting around listening to Jesus as he talked. And all of a sudden the Pharisees and the scribes Bringing this woman so embarrassed, so humiliated, and throw her at the feet of Jesus. See, remember, in her mind, they're about to stone her to death. 
She's about to die. How about if you were the ones there that day just hearing what Jesus was saying? I conclude with this today. Would you be the accuser? Always finding faults in everybody else but yourself. Would you be the accuser that loves to sound the alarm to when others have failed? You know what I'm talking about. We'll sit in the seats sometimes in the church and when someone walks in, have you heard? Did you hear about? Maybe you're not the accuser. Maybe you're just the attendees. Those that were there to hear Jesus talk. Well, Pastor, what did they do wrong? Nothing. Because they did nothing. They stood there as the scribes and the Pharisees condemned this woman to death. And they didn't say a word. Sometimes our silence is what kills us. Abraham Lincoln said this, to sin by silence when they should protest makes coward of men. Have you been in that situation where you've seen others accused and condemned and talked about and gossiped and you just stood idly by when you could have said something? It's one thing I can say that I'm so proud of my son about. My son is one of those that he always takes the side of the weak, the one that everybody's against. He gets a little mad with it sometimes. But I do hope and pray that he learned that from his father and his mother. But maybe you're not the accuser or the attendee. Maybe you're the adulterer. In fact, can I say this today with all certainty in my heart? You are the adulterer. Pastor John, I've never committed adultery. I have never cheated on my spouse. That's not me. Maybe you're right. Maybe you've never been unfaithful to your spouse, but you've been unfaithful to your God. You cheated against him. So all of us in this room today, we are the adulterer. But my heart would be this. That you wouldn't be the accuser or the attendee or the adulterer. That you would have the attitude of Jesus. that you don't condemn, but you love. You don't put down, you try to build up. Yes, I listen, I don't affirm your sin, but I won't alienate you because of your sin. See, there's two very important lessons that we learn from this passage today. The first is this, God does not condemn you. He loves you. And despite all your failures and your mistakes, He still loves you. But He also doesn't want to leave you where you are. Because He knows where that sin will take you. To destruction and to death. I want you to bow your eyes. Bow your head close your eyes. No one's looking around today. It's just you, me, and the Lord. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you.
Maybe today you're that adulterous woman, not in unfaithfulness to your spouse, but in faithfulness to your God. Pastor, there's some things in my life that don't belong. They need to go, and I'm sorry. Just like that woman, and she heard the words of Jesus, go and sin no more. There's some things in your life today that you need to let go of, get rid of, put behind you. But I just want you to slip up your hand right now. Is there anybody? Amen. Amen. Yes. Lord, I pray over every hand that went up in this service. Forgive them today of their sins, their unfaithfulness. I pray today, Lord, in Jesus' name. through the blood that you shed make them right to the Father and forgive them of all their sins or maybe today you're the accuser or the silent attendees that you struggle accusing others or pointing out sins and you know today God's not pleased with that He wants you to help, not hurt. He wants you to build up, not tear down. He doesn't want you to affirm their sin, but he doesn't want you to alienate them because of their sin. Some of you have just remained silent. You've seen how others have been torn down. If that's you today, and say, Pastor, I'm sorry. I've lived a life of accusations, condemnation. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand today. Is there anybody? Amen. Lord, I pray for the hands that have gone up. That I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, forgive them. For the lack of compassion. For their spirit of condemnation. Forgive them today, I pray. And I close with this today. I don't know where your heart's at. But maybe today you got a glimpse of the loving Jesus that maybe you've never heard about. You thought he condemned and accused. The Bible says he's not the accuser of the brethren. You've had this idea that there's no way with your faults, your failures, your past that God could ever love you. But you've learned today that that's not the Jesus that the Bible talks about. That that Jesus loves you and doesn't condemn you. But desires to have a relationship with you. If you're here today and you would like to give your heart and life to Christ. To accept Him as Lord and Savior. If that is you today, then I want you to raise your hand right now. Is there anybody? Lord, I thank you today. We believe all are saved and on their way to heaven. Lord, if there's anyone here today that is afraid to raise their hand, let them not leave this service without making a decision today to come to know Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give God praise. Amen. Amen. We're so thankful for Pastor John coming in and sharing that word. It's so good. It's something for all of us to remember that we we all fall short. I'm thankful for God's grace and that he is there walking with us in the middle of our mess to get us on the other side of it. Amen. So if it is your first time with us today, we're so glad that you are here. On your way in, you probably uh, saw our booth and you may have already received a Next Step card. If you didn't get one already, you have one in front of you in the pocket right there on the back of the seat. And there's also a QR code that you can scan, fill out the information. Go ahead and do that. And if you haven't already, when you walk outside, we have a counter Um, they have a gift for you. Make sure you go to our new here counter. Make sure you get that gift. It's something you do not want to miss out on. And also, if it's your second
second week with us here at Passion. We're so glad to see you again. If you would, as soon as we are done here, um, I want to make my way to the back. If you if you beat me there, Pastor Jason is standing in the back. He, we have a gift for you. We want to make sure that you don't miss out on that. We just want to say thank you for coming back. And and if at any point in time in today's service you decided to get your to give your give your life to Christ, or 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 maybe you decided, hey, today I'm getting back on track. We want you to text this number text the word saved and we have materials that we're going to put into your hands and we're going to connect with you because this discipleship journey is something that we're not called to do alone but we are here we're going to join up together with you and we're going to help you take the first steps into your discipleship journey and also if you're someone and you you aren't serving and maybe it's like hey i'm ready to get involved and start serving we hope that all of us that are here today get involved and start serving text the same number text the word serve and we will connect with you and get you plugged in to an area that fits your giftings and the things that God has put inside of you the best that we can. Amen? Amen. We don't have a video today, um, but the one announcement that I want to highlight, if you, if you want to see all of them, make sure you get your bulletin and uh, read through all of the announcements. But next week is for, the 4th of July, and we are going to celebrate together. We're going to have one gathering, and we're not going to gather here going to be across the street at Overholzer Elementary School. They've been so great to let us use their 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 yard and field and everything. We're going to have a lot of fun. Make sure you come bring a lawn chair. Um, I think uh, what you need to bring is drinks and a dessert. I think that's the that's the word. And then also bring something that you don't mind getting dirty or getting, if you plan on getting wet, bring some things to get wet. If you have a really cool water gun, bring a really cool water gun. We'll have some water guns there. We're going to have a lot of fun. It's going to be awesome just to have some time and celebrate the 4th of July together next week. Amen. Amen. We're going to, we're giving our offering. It's on your way, on your way out. You can give it in the buckets and you can also scan the QR code. There's another one on the back of the seat. You can also go to the green room or, or give online. You can also text to give. Thank you so much for your faithfulness. Giving is something that is non-negotiable in our, in our lives, in my family. And it's been time and time again, God has showed like, it's not about how much money we have in the bank because he is our source. So if he's asking me to give, it's something that's like, there's no question we're going to give. And I'm so thankful that that he has showed up time and time again. So thank you for your faithfulness and giving. Just know that God is our source. God is your source. No matter how much you have in the bank, if he's asking you to give, I encourage you to just step up and do what he's asking you to do. It'd be the best decision of your life. Amen? Amen. All right. God, I thank you for allowing us to come together and hear your truth and join as a body here. And I just pray that that the words that we heard allow us to better go and engage the culture around us. God, you've called us to go out and be a light. God, I just pray that we are able to walk in the grace that you have shown us and also to give that grace to those that are around us. In Jesus' name, amen. We love you so much. We'll see you next week at Overholzer Elementary School.